Sacramento yesterday and got home very, very late. So I apologize that I'm looking a little haggard this morning. <laughs> um, it's, it's hard to do those trips. They're great to do, but it can be challenging to do. But it's wonderful to see everybody today. And we are so excited to have our presenter who is not only faculty in early childhood education and an expert in children and especially our youngest learners, uh, but she's also a mentor in our CPTP program, which is so wonderful, so wonderful. Shanti, we are thrilled that you are here today. Thank you so much for leading us through this experience of learning about promoting preschool language. Um, just yesterday when I was in Sacramento, I was talking with some of our colleagues at the Commission on Teacher Credentialing, and I said, I've got one North Star, and that is children and families. And North Star is what guides me in everything I do. So everybody always thinks I'm all about teacher preparation. Why do I want to train California's teachers? for children and families. And so thank you so much for honoring children today. And thank you everybody for being here on this beautiful early morning. And thank you for leading us on this uh, workshop today. Thank you, Renee, for that. And, and just like um, Shanta, I hope I said your name right, said in the chat box, don't be silly, you look great. I want to repeat Shantae. that. It's Shanta. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, thank you all again, uh, like Renee said, um, our guiding light um, in all the work that we do is basically keeping children and families in mind as we do what we do. So I'm so glad that you all took the time to be here this morning honoring children. I love that, Renee, from your words this morning, uh, honoring children and being here. So again, um, I'm just overwhelmed with the response I've received or we have received for uh, this workshop. So let's get going without any further delay. I'm just super excited to have you. And my name is Shanti Tarue. Please address me as Shanti. I'm so comfortable with you just calling me Shanti. Um, anytime, feel free to um, ask questions, um, whether it's unmuting yourself um, or putting it in the chat box. I am going to request if there is a question that pops up in the chat box, and I'm not, you know, because I'm sharing screen, I don't have access to the chat box on my screen. So if somebody could just holler and say, hey, there's a question in the chat box. So I, you know, go right to the question because it could be very relevant to what I'm sharing at that time. So we don't want to miss that opportunity to get questions answered or clarified. So please feel free to stop me and tell me that Ooh, there is a question. Yeah. So let's go ahead and have some fun this morning. I'm hoping that It'll be an interactive session where you're all willing to share your experiences. I value every one of your experience that you bring to the table today so we can all share and learn from each other, not just from me, right? So bring your experience here, put it on the table so we can all learn from each other. So let's begin. I'm going to see how this is going to work on Zoom, right? So this is a super duper song. So we'll quickly get introduced to each other. Um, so. It's a little chant, so I'm going to go ahead and do it to kind of do the syllables music. So I'm going to show you how it goes. It says super duper one, two, three. Can you say your name for me? So you're going to go ahead and unmute yourself and say your name, any of you, right? So I'm going to start with me. So we know how it goes. And then whoever's willing and uh, ready to, you know, unmute and just say your first name. That's all we're asking at this time. Right? So let's go. Super duper one, two, three. Can you say your name for me? My name is Shanti. Shanti. Hello, Shanti. Join our game. All right. So, who will share their name next? Super duper. All right, Renee. Super. Okay, I'm try it. Did we do it together, right? Sure. Okay. I'm going to sing softly so there's no Zoom audio lag. So I'm going to let you kind of lead it and I'm going to be very soft. Okay, well, I'm going to try it. Super duper one, two, three. Can you say your name for me? My name is Renee. Renee, Renee. Hello, Renee. Join our game. Awesome. Thank you, Renee. Who mm -hmm. would be willing to go next? I'll go next. All right. Shantae. 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 <laughs> Thank you for correcting me. Yes. Please do. Okay. Super duper, one, two, three. Can you say your name for me? My name is Shante. 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 Hello, Shante. Join our game. Hello. Good morning. Welcome, Shante. Good morning. Yes, I'll go next. <laughs> yes, please do. All right. 
Super duper one, two, three. Can you say your name for me? My name is Gloria. Gloria. Hello, Gloria. Join our game. Awesome. Thank you, Gloria. We can take one more participant if they're willing. Anyone else? Don't okay, my name is Apple. I'm sorry, say that again. Apple. Sure, go for it, Ethel. Okay, super duper, one, two, three. Can you say your name for me? My name is Ethel. Ethel, Ethel, hello, Ethel, join our gang. Awesome, thank you all. I am so super excited that you were all willing to share your names and clap your syllables out. Welcome, welcome. We are going to be today talking about, you know, ways to promote language in children. We hear so many strategies all the time. We're gonna look at how we can actually apply them as we interact with young children um, in our lives. So these are our goals that we wanna achieve in today's workshop. So we're gonna explore some ways, different ways of you know, enriching communication with children. That way we can promote language with them and also discuss some strategies. How can we um, rethink the way we converse with them to have meaningful conversations that really um, promotes higher order thinking skills. So let's go ahead and talk about that today and get some hands-on practical ways you can apply these strategies. So I'm hoping that we can walk away with some strategies that can actually start implementing the minute you walk out of that workshop or get out of the Zoom meeting, right? So here we go. I'm hoping this will be interactive learning, right? So. Let's go ahead and share our experience so we can learn from each other, stay engaged as best as you can, make sure you hydrate yourself, have some water. Although it's cloudy this morning, right? Ask questions anytime. No question is too silly. So feel free to unmute yourself, ask questions in the chat box, have fun. That's the whole game, right? Having fun as we learn. That's the hope this morning. But here we are. We gotta remember always, although we are educators working with children, I always like to keep this in mind that parents are a child's first and most important teacher. We are here to support that process uh, as educators, caregivers, right? We are here to support them in their journey, um, nurturing their child. So every child needs a family member to talk and interact to him or her every day. And of course, educators, not just a family member, right? Someone to talk with them all the time. So just some fundamental ideas about how or how children um, learn language or vocabulary, right? At about age two, um, they are typical, typically uh, supposed to have 500 words in their vocabulary bank. And about 10,000 by age six. Between two years and six years, that's about four years. Look at how much multiplication of the number of words they acquire happens. So what does this tell us, right? This age group, the early childhood years is so important that we provide their brain is developing, making all these neural connections you know, based on experiences that they are receiving in their everyday life. And so we must use this optimum chance to promote language at this age. The one-time children, as have you noticed? How many of you have noticed that the, you know, you don't even know where they hear, heard it? Sometimes they'll repeat things and you're like, where did they hear that? I never taught this to them, right? They just fast map so quickly. The one time they get exposed to something, whether it's an object, word, whatever it is, they quickly register that in their brain. And that's because Based on research, brain, it tells us that during this age, brain development is happening so quickly, the neural connections are getting formed and strengthened based on repeated experiences. So the more we expose them to meaningful, rich experiences, they are going to, the brain is going to map it, you know, store it in their memory bank, and that is going to really help them learn further cognitively as well. So uh, there are a few more people joining in. I'm sorry if I'm looking distracted because I am trying to admit them into the meeting. So I do see, um, oh, awesome, Cindy. Thank you for that. No, you're gonna sing it with your children's students. 
in the class, awesome. Thank you, Renee, for responding and keeping the chat box alive. Thank you. All right, so we're gonna come back here. So oftentimes when I work with young children, parents have asked me, I used to work um, in a Head Start classroom for about seven years at the classroom and then later on in, at the administrative level, many parents. So I had a lot of bilingual families in my class or some were even trilingual, depending on how many languages they were exposed to at home. And parents would actually ask me, is it okay? We're talking about promoting preschool language here. They would ask me, I you know, want my child to be doing better in English because I never learned English really well. And so I want them to learn practice English more. And so I don't talk to them in my home language at home. And so I always tell them that, no, we don't want to lose your home language. Personally, my children, were English language learners, right? Their primary language at home, in our home, is not English. And so I spoke to my uh, children in home language and they did not start speaking in English till they started preschool at the age of three. They understood, they were able to comprehend English, but not necessarily speak fluently in English because I, I did that on purpose. I wanted them to learn our home language primarily because they say even when I read somewhere, to people, when they lose their home language, they lose about 60% lose about of their culture. And so language and culture is so linked and we don't want that to happen to our children where they lose not only our home language, but also our culture that we come from because we all bring so much from our background that we come from. So we don't want to lose that. So I always tell families, please don't let uh, your children lose your home language because research tells us that it can even learning multiple languages, having multiple experiences in life actually could act, put a break on neurocognitive disorders like Alzheimer's later on in life. And so we want to keep our brain active, all parts of our brain, right? To be able to speak in two different languages, you're using multiple parts of our brain. And so we don't wanna use pocket, lose pockets of brain uh, functioning. And so we wanna keep our brain active and we wanna learn multiple languages as best as we can. Some of us I know are more prone to learning new languages very quickly, though, though I'm not. Um, it takes me a while. It's a challenge for me to learn new languages at this age, but I'm sure many of you are probably prone or, um, you know, to learn newer languages easily. So I'm gonna ask a question. So let's think about this, right? As we are beginning to talk about supporting language development in young children, what are some ways you think that we as adults can promote language development in young children? What are some ways you think? Let me see how, um, what your thoughts are at this point about promoting um, language development. What are some ways? Feel free to unmute yourself in the chat box. How can we promote um, language? Books. Uh, awesome. reading, reading a lot of books. Yeah. Yes, Sophia, reading them books. That's a great way to promote language. We'll, we'll talk more about that as we go through. Uh, singing, yes. They love rhymes and chants. And yes, that's an awesome way to promote language. And we'll talk about that too more as we further along in the workshop. Any other ways, reading, singing, thank you all for sharing music, books, love it, love your, love your responses. Yes, those are great ways to support their language. Shanti, yes. I think about one thing I absolutely love to do and I love to witness. When I'm with a child like in a grocery store or in Target or Walmart and they're in that part of my shopping cart, I utilize that as an opportunity for learning. So it's like, I don't want them on a device. I want them looking around the store, whether they can talk or not. Cause even if they can't speak, it doesn't mean that they're not understanding us. They usually yeah. can understand quite a bit. And so I literally will be like, oh, I see you looking over at the toy. Look, that toy is green. I wonder if we touch it, if it's gonna squeak you know, to see if the child will reach out for it. Good, I'm glad you're reaching out for it. Why don't we grab that toy and see what's gonna happen? Do you see the lady over there in the line? She's wearing a striped dress today. Her dress is two colors, it's black and white. You're like literally like <laughs> just saying whatever's happening. And sometimes it it sounds kind of silly to do it, like, or you maybe not sounds, but like feels kind of silly. 
but man, the kids eat that up. They love it when you're talking with them, even if they can't. Has anybody seen that um, video that's on um, TikTok where it's like this dad and his little boy and the little boy is maybe like six months, seven months old. And the dad starts talking and the little boy goes, no, 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 no. Right. Is that the one? Yeah. You can't tell what he's saying, but there's melody and there's prosody and like he's communicating even though the intonation of the voice right the intonation of the voice is is totally in conversation mode and that's what young children love it's not about just giving them the attention they need where you're you know it's about promote so many things happening it's social emotional development language development telling them that i'm listening to you you matter right it doesn't matter if it makes sense what you're babbling makes sense or not but it's telling them that you're valuable yeah. I, i'm here to listen to you right give well, that, that used self- the right word she said narrate i never used the word narrate but that's exactly it and then august made a really good point in the chat too i never really baby talked to my niece i spoke to her like an adult and then answered any questions she had as we went along i'm wondering if that's an effective method absolutely i actually do not use baby talk when i yeah. talk to kids i'm you know, I might change the intonation of my voice, like Shanti saying, but you won't ever hear me ooh, like, you know, goo goo gaga. It's like I'm talking to that child like they are totally going to talk back to me. And um, Tulia shared that talking, asking questions, and we're going to talk more about that. That's a great way to not just make them talk more, but also to make them think more. Asking those questions is going to re- really get their cognitive juice is flowing in their brain, right? So awesome, awesome sharing. Thank you all. I can see that you all have many strategies already. I can add two more. So here are some strategies um, that we're going to discuss today. And many of these or all of these you've already shared, but we're going to go in detail with each of them. Talking with our children, right? Talking with our children is primary way in promoting language. Asking questions, you shared that as well. Responding to your words child is saying, and how can we converse back or respond back in ways where we can introduce new vocabulary, right? That is another strategy that we can learn to use with our young children. And of course, rhymes and chants and songs that many of you already shared. We started off with that this morning with a chant, right? To introduce ourselves, um, retelling personal stories. I personally love, love, loved doing this with my own children. Sometimes my children, just so you know, they are adults now. They are 22 and I have twins. I have two 22 year olds and I love, even now I talk about when they were younger, what are some of the things they used to do or family stories that I have. So we're going to talk more about that as we go. So going in, um, with talking with your child. Um, oh, twins turned 16 today. Yay, Renee. Happy birthday to them. So um, here we go, talking with your child. So research says, says that exposure to language from a very young age promotes preschool language, right? So when do we do this with them? All the time. Where? Everywhere, wherever they are with you, right? wherever children are with them, every single moment is an opportunity to promote language. So not like Renee said, grocery stores, doing laundry at home, cooking at home, right? Everywhere they're with us, we converse with them. One way to do is morning messages, right? We think that this can only be done at a school setting. It can be done at home. You could have a morning message every day and you know, as we're getting ready for school, getting ready for the day, Today is whatever the day is, Jenna is eating breakfast, mom is eating breakfast, just describing what we're doing. The bird outside is eating breakfast and pointing to what's outside the window, teaching them to observe what's happening around them. Many lessons being learned just through the morning message. It is print awareness, it is conversations, language, what to expect for the day, because children love to know they they don't like to be blindsided, right? Throw something last minute at them, and that's going to throw their complete, throw them completely off. So we want to front load them with what to expect for the day. So it's promoting language, promoting print awareness, promoting, um, you know, focus for the day. This is what we're doing for the day, right? So morning messages could involve many 
It could be the to-do list. You don't want to have a long to-do list like the one I have next to my desk right here, but just a few to get them going for the day. Yes, Renee, I see a raised hand. You have a request to go back one slide, Shanti, that somebody was taking, or Anjali's taking notes. I was also wondering, are, um, please let me know if, it, if, it, if we're allowed to share the slide deck um, at a later time with attendees. It's up to you as the presenter, of course, but okay. um, is it okay to go back just one slide so they can finish taking their notes? Sure. Thank you, so uh, thank you really uh, Renee, for watching out for, let me see, let me go back. Thank you. Thank you so much. Of course, of course. I also, while you're doing that, Sophia has a great suggestion here. It says, and I totally did this too, Sophia, so I love this. One way I use it with my children is by having them read while driving, reading the signs and advertising boards along the way. Sophia, I, that's such a great strategy because every kid can read McDonald's. Every kid yeah. can read Ralph's. Even if they can't read it, they know it and they know the brand. And when they feel confident reading, it that's part of the magic, right, Shanti? And it, you know, um, language begins with just awareness, making that connection that words or letters mean something. They stand or represent something, right? Letters and symbols represent language. That's how um, awareness begins in young children. Like Renee said, how many of you have seen like, you know, you, your child does not know how to read, but when you pull into that Target parking lot, they see that bullseye sign and they know it's Target. Mommy, we are at Target or Daddy, we're at Target, right? And so print awareness be begins with that correlation of, you know, putting symbols and letters have some kind of a meaning. They represent something, right? And so that's really important to, to make use of that opportunity. So I see a lot of, um, yes, now 14. Thank you, thank you for all your share outs. Any questions that I'm missing? No, okay, all right, thank you. All right, close the chat box here. All right, that was our morning message. I'm gonna keep going. So um, Renee kind of touched on this a little bit. So one way to um, have conversations, even if they are not able to talk to back to us, right? Describing what they are doing. So, um, Let's say a child is playing with block. So when, when we are watching that child, describe what he or she is doing, right? That's one way to introduce sentences, phrases, new words, whatever it is that you are introducing in that sentence. So describe to them, I see that you are building with blocks. I see that you are putting a yellow square block on top of a brown square, a blue rectangle, is you are placing that on top of the yellow block, right? So describing exactly what they are doing, and that is called parallel talk. So they are actually doing the work. We're actually re just describing what they are doing. And so that's one way to introduce new vocabulary, have talking to them, right? Make sure that we're using words that our child will understand, depending on where they are developmentally along the language acquisition Continuum, right? We want to make sure that we use the words that they can understand so that they, they'll, they'll re listen to those sounds the letters make and they'll make that connection. Keep the sentences short and simple. We don't need to be using fancy words, long sentences, right? Just enough for them to listen to us talking. That's really, really important. Um, Let's see, chat box is lighting up. Yeah, Krispy Kreme. <laughs> yeah, donuts. Okay, all right. So keeping the um, sentences short and simple is going to be very helpful. Another strategy is self-talking. So this is describing what I am doing, right? So if I'm doing the dishes, I describe what I'm saying. I am picking up, I'm turning the water on, picking up the dirty dish, or even you can even say what you're picking up. I'm picking up the plate. I'm going to get a sponge and I'm going to rinse it off, take all the food out. And then I'm going to get some soap on my sponge and I'm going to make bubbles, right? And so describing what I am doing, and that is actually, we do that probably all the time already, like Renee was sharing out, right? 
but sometimes we don't know what what te technically it's called in supporting language in children, right? So this is self-talk when we're describing what we're doing, right? When we're describing what they are doing would be parallel talk. Like um, Renee was saying, I see that at the target, the squeaky toy, it's green, right? If I wonder if it'll squeak if I press it, right? All that was great example for parallel and self-talk. Right, let's see. So the second tip would be actually asking questions. So this is something that I really want to emphasize that um, the style of communication, asking them open-ended questions is very much related to promoting preschool language, literacy and number knowledge. So when do we ask them questions? All the time, right? And where? Everywhere, wherever they are with you, right? Every opportunity they're with us is actually very, very conducive to promote language. So how to do this? So we will use three, um, top three um, ways, car or just a simple comment, right? Asking questions can just begin with a simple comment and then thinking what they are thinking about it. And maybe they'll throw a question at us so we can answer or they'll ask you know, say something back and we can ask a question based on that, right? And then asking age appropriate questions this is really important. We wanna make sure we understand where the child is in their growth and development cognitively, right? And so, and in their language acquisition process. And so we want to introduce questions and vocabulary based on where they are at. We wanna meet them where they are. We wanna challenge them enough so they can learn more but we don't want to frustrate them by throwing in all these fancy, complicated words that they have not been exposed to. We're introducing new, new vocabulary. We must explain what that is or tell them what the meaning is and then respond to their questions or responses and add a little more so they can start thinking more about it. We'll talk a little bit more about open-ended versus close-ended questions, right? Open-ended versus close-ended. What are they? So start with a simple comment, right? So the first part of CAR is start with a simple comment and then pause and wait if your child says anything. Let's say take that example in that um, parallel talk slide where the child was uh, building with blocks, right? And so if we use that example, um, a few more people still joining. So let me go ahead and admit them. Sorry about that, that I'm a little distracted here. Okay, back, back here. Um, when the child is playing with the block and say, I see that you are building with blocks and then give them a moment to process that. Think about that. Oftentimes we bombard them with, we are so super excited to promote that language and we just throw questions at them or comments nonstop continuously, right? But children need, even us, we need time to process the information we're listening to. So start with a simple comment, I see, that you're playing with blocks today and pause and wait a few seconds to see if the child is re replying or saying anything. And then based on that, depending on if they're saying anything or not, if not, add another comment. Oh, I see that it, your, your structure is getting taller or the color block that they are using or what we think, right? We want to keep it very neutral as to we don't want to label what the structure is because we want them to think about it, right? So add another comment that's very general. I see that your structure, instead of saying building or a tower, right? It's for them to figure out what they are building or asking them, I wonder what you are building today, right? I wonder, and then so make them think about what they are building if they haven't already thought about it, right? So add another comment if they are not responding to us. Then after, throw in an open-ended question. And if they don't respond, they are not, you know, they're not ignoring us. It's just they are not, you know, responding. So don't get discouraged. Let them be, play for a few more minutes and then come back and touch base with them. Sometimes we all need our time alone, right? We just want to focus on what we're doing and we just want to be with ourselves. 
just enjoying what we're doing. And so children need that too. So if they do not respond to our comments or questions at that time, then we know they're giving us a message that I want to continue to play on my own and give them a few minutes and come back and say, I'm observing you. I see you're playing really well with the blocks, right? And then at that time, they may be willing to respond back or ask a question and then engage in that conversation. Nothing should be forced. Um, and um, uh, I'm sorry. Yes, um, I can make you co-host. Um, let me get to the participant list. So nothing should be forced on young children. It should be very organic and natural for them to engage in a conversation, right? And so we should be very mindful about um, me, I'm finding you to make you a co-host. There we go. Thank you, Renee, for doing that for me. All right. So yeah, nothing should be forced on young children. It should be very natural conversation. And so they, they shouldn't be um, you know, forced into having a conversation, asking a question. So what are open-ended questions? So open-ended questions are que those questions that cannot be answered with a simple yes or a no. So um, it, it will build upon, basically they often begin with a what, why, how, that makes them think about their response, right? Um, it builds upon our own, the child's response. So whatever the child responds to your own a comment or a question, you kind of build upon it, add more to that when we ask open-ended questions. So, um, Let's think about uh, some examples of open-ended questions. So here are some general open-ended questions. What would happen if, right? When we're reading a, a book, I wonder, just like the one I had shared when, I wonder what you're building this morning. That looks very interesting, right? What do you think about this? What should we do, right? Any question that begins with a how, what, why, or you know, making them think about it, where can also be added. So any question, I'm going to go back to the previous slide, any question that asks for more than a, just a simple yes or a no answer would be an open-ended question. Can somebody think of any examples of open-ended questions you could ask, let's say, if they are uh, in the sandbox? Let's say if children are playing in the sandbox, that would be our scenario for our examples today. Can you think about an open-ended question if you could ask a child that's working in the sandbox. Anybody willing to share an open-ended question, an example? Uh, I will. Sure, um, thank you. I wonder what you will be working on today. I wonder what you will be working on today. If the child hasn't thought about it, right? Sometimes they themselves don't know what they're building, what they're making, right? And that's okay. They just want to engage with the materials that we have set out. And so asking them, I wonder what you will be building today or making today, right? Perfect. Thank you, Andre. I hope I said your name right. Thank you for sharing that example. Wonderful open-ended question right, getting started with their activity and you ask that question and they may not respond to us and you're just wondering, you're not asking them a question. So they may not, even if it's a question format, they may not respond to us and that's okay. It's just to get them thinking about it. Any other examples that you can think of? What else do we need in the sandbox? Thank you, Jennifer, for sharing. Yes, what else do we need in the sandbox? And then building on what Andre shared, right? I wonder what you will be making today. And so if they start to think about it and they think about some materials that could be added to the sandbox to help them make that, they may ask us, right? Those are great you know, questions to build upon. I wonder what you will be making today. What else do we need in the sandbox, right? As they're engaging and if they tell you, I'm, I'm thinking of making a mountain, right? And so what else do we need to build a mountain then, right? That's a great follow-up question. What else could we use, right? Uh, it's a, another follow-up question beyond that. Awesome, awesome, provoking their thought process. How does the sand feel? Yes, and so that could give you so many opportunities to build a conversation on. All these open-ended questions is promoting so many different things. Yes, they are listening to new words, languages, right? right? Words and vocabulary, sentences. 
the, it's promoting their thought process, provoking them to think about what they have to do. What do they need, right? So many things happening. Yes, I, I see a raised hand. I'm not sure who, but- Shanti, um, it was but just I, me. I was, I was gonna just share one bit. Um, I love just opening up with like a generic question, like, so what's going on in here right now? You know, just something like, what's happening today in the sandbox? But another thing too, every single parent teacher conference or guardian teacher conference I did my entire career, I started off with an open-ended question. I used the same exact one for every single conference, Shanti. And it was, what are your dreams for your child's future? And so open-ended questions with children are, are like, magical but we also don't utilize them with adults enough and so i would suggest too like in your engagements with parents and caregivers and you know um any foster parents whoever is you know parenting the children in your classroom um to try to trickle in some open-ended questions with adults too because i feel like you know yeah. we're so definite you know and it's like we all want to be able to express and engage and you know just what you're saying here building the child's response connecting to the topic and it, um, it's relevant for all ages, but in the sandbox, I'm sometimes super generic, like what's going on <laughs> to see what they're going to say. Right. And to know where, what their thought process is so we can build on that. Right. So asking an open and a generic question like that gives us an idea about what they are thinking, right? That's what we want to know. What are they thinking and how can they promote that thought process? How can I add to that and build on what they're already thinking, right? So these are some great ways to get conversation started, the open-ended questions. And so we wanna be mindful. Every question that we can think of, um, we if, if it sounds close-ended, so I always, you know, it comes with practice, how to um, turn it into an open-ended question. Sometimes it's just a, oh, do you like ice cream, right? That would become yes or no. And we want them to think about it. And, and we can turn that same question into an open-ended question. And we'll talk about that in just a couple more slides. So the opposite of open-ended question, right? So it's a simple yes or no answer. And the example would be, do you like ice cream? And the, the only two response can be yes or no. Some children may still build on that and say, yes, I love ice cream. I love strawberries or I love uh, chocolate chip ice cream. Whatever it is, they may build on that. They may get so excited about ice cream and they may actually continue a conversation with that but a lot of children stop there right stop at a yes or a no and then the conversation comes to a halt and so we want to be mindful as we pose questions to them right do you like ice cream? i might get a little bit here or do you want an apple right yes or a no answer is what is warranted here so we want to make sure asking them how can we so let's think about this if there is a question like, do you like ice cream? And that's close ended. Can you think of ways to change this to an open ended question? How can we change? Do you like ice cream to an open ended question? Anyone be willing to share? What is do your you favorite ice cream? Yes. What is your favorite ice cream? That's asking them to think about their favorite flavor, right? uh sabrina yes we can talk about that the slides later yes um that's a great way myra was that myra that answered yes what flavor yes or what what is your favorite ice cream what ice cream do you like awesome how about do you want an apple can somebody try to change that into an open-ended format do you want an apple what shape um, um, I'm sorry, I missed that. Uh, what shape is the apple? What shape is the apple? We could talk about shapes, yes. What do you think also... the apple tastes like? What do you think the apple tastes like? It makes and you them... get about the two color of apple. Apple come in red and uh, green. Yeah, you can ask about colors. What colors do apples come in? What do you think apples taste like, right? Leads them to think about further things, colors, taste right and then it, it, when you talk about taste what what do you th think apples taste like they could bring up oh green apple is sour or i love re uh, red delicious or you can introduce different types of apples this way right and even colors green apples versus red apples or you know golden delicious and you can talk about different colors so open-ended versus close-ended it makes some open-ended questions, makes them think about it. You are provoking their thought process to make them think more about apples or ice cream 
whatever it is that you're conversing about. And it allows them to use their imagination. Excuse me. Sandbox, I wonder what you're going to be making today in the sandbox or also oh, what's happening here at the sandbox, right? It really lets them use their imagination. And they could stop telling you a story about it. I'm going to build a mountain and then I'm going to build track. I'm going to put trees on here, right? And so they are going to add more to that because it's going to let their, in that, and that's what young children at this age, the preschool age, three to five, six years of age, that's what they do best is pretend and imagine different things, right? And so they want to replicate what adults do in their young life at this stage. And so they're going to say, I'm going to do this. I'm going to hike like mommy on the mountain or whatever it is that they are, you know, exposed to experiences at home. They are going to be imagining that and they're going to bring that into their play. We'll see that represented in their play. Uh, I see a raised hand. Guillermo, I hope I said your name right. Guillermo. Yes, yes, yes. Actually, yeah, I just want to add something else. Um, now that you guys are, were using the example of the apple, that uh, I, I believe I work in, I'm a, um, in the school as a teacher assistant. And he was doing the other day, English teacher, he was doing uh, an activity, which I think is awesome because uh, promotes. Uh... I lost you, Guillermo, are you still talking? Guillermo? Right what they see in the flashcard using the five senses, sight, hearing, smell, taste, and touch. So it, it was it was incredible how many how many ways they can describe. I mean they they were they were trying to uh, describe an apple. So they were they were talking about how sweet it is, which is uh, the taste, the the texture which is spiky touch and how 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 it looks is yellow. So there's yeah. so many so many so many so many ways that they describe it and Yes, Guillermo, thank you so much for sharing. Yes, those questions lend itself to further activities, right? It is not just about how do you think an apple tastes like was a great question that I want to say Myra, I'm not sure who, who shared, right? How do you think the apple tastes, right? It's going to lend itself to so many other activities based on that. So we can talk about it and then we can say, okay, everybody bring one apple to school tomorrow, whatever apple you have at home. And then we bring a few different varieties and then we can cut them and we can taste them and use all our five senses, right? Does it taste good dipped in peanut butter, eat by itself, further delving into tasting apples, right? Just tasting them by itself different colors and comparing which one we like the most and maybe making a poster out of it, right? Red apple, golden delicious, green apple, right? Shanti likes this the best, right? And then Renee likes this, Guillermo likes this apple. And so visual representation of language is going to be added to this conversation here. And so such open-ended questions are so rich in lending themselves to furthering our activities. And they're gonna tell us what they wanna do next. You know, we will think about lesson planning, talk about lesson planning. Children, based on the responses we get from these open-ended questions, we automatically got some activities here that we can build on and have plans for them, for them to learn from. And so it allows them to use their imagination, gives them further information. There may be children, we gotta remember, not all children have eaten apples or tasted different kind of apples at home, depending on you know, various factors that can affect them having access to different types of apples. Sometimes it's just a family thing. We're not into apples and we just don't buy enough apples, different kinds or we just like a certain, the adults in the house like a certain type of apple. And so that's all is bought at home. And so they don't have access to a variety of different apples at home. And sometimes it's economic factors, right? That they don't have access to enough apples at home. It could be multiple reasons why they don't have enough access to apples at home. And so it gives them more information. If I don't have exposure to different types of apples, and so my teacher asked me, what could an apple taste like? And I don't know because I've never tasted an apple. And I'm gonna tell the teacher, you know, Ms. Shanti, I don't know how an apple tastes like. And so that's gonna lend itself to different activities on apples. As an educator, I'm going to bring in different types of apples so all my students can have the same starting point. So they can all know what an apple tastes like first to begin with. And then 
what different apples taste like, right? So there's so many layers to asking open-ended questions. Um, they allow them to use their cognitive skills in problem solving, right? And, and, and a, one child shares that I've never tasted a green apple before. And so a friend in the class would say, you know, it tastes really sour. It's really green. I don't like green apples or I love them because it's so sour, right? And so they're going to have more social conversations with their peers, helping each other out, teaching them, this is how it tastes like, this is how it looks like. And then if we build on that and do more activities on tasting apples, that's going to give them more information. It really helps them search in their memory bank about new vocabulary that they have learned. We talked about fast mapping. The one time they hear something, they store it, right? And so they're going to, the brain is going to scan their memory and see, do I have words to, to express myself for this question? Right? It makes them think about their thoughts, right? And, and come up with sentences. Think about dual language learners. Those children that are learning English at school, this is their only exposure to English at, at school and they learn, speak a different language at home. We are promoting language development by making them think. They may not be able to express themselves in English. However, they are thinking still. If they can understand, comprehend and not be able to express, they're thinking still in their language, they are thinking, how does an apple taste like? And, and me being, um, you know, I worked with a lot of different families that came from different uh, languages at home. So I had Parsi, Nepalese, Hindi, uh, Spanish. I had Japanese families that I served so many. I had Korean families, Vietnamese families. I had so many different languages children came from in my classroom and they all knew I did not speak their home language, right? I did not speak their home language. And the only way they can communicate to me at school is in English, right? But I would still talk to them in English slowly and, and, and so that they can still hear those sounds. But over the course of a couple months, they were able to understand contextually, because I brought in props. When I talked about apples, I showed an apple and I said, how does an apple taste like? Mm, does it taste sweet? Does it say sour? Because I don't like sour, right? So I make that face. So they see that I'm talking about taste and I go mm, and rub my belly. Mm, it tastes good, right? Make all these actions along with my words. So my English learners can contextually understand what I'm talking about, right? So we can promote English language, language in all children, dual language learners as well, by asking these questions, allowing them to think about their thoughts. So let's go ahead and practice. Um, we did that already. So Claude, have you ever been to the zoo? How can we change that into an open-ended question? This is a, have you ever been to the zoo? Is yes or no, right? How can we change this to an open-ended question? Any takers for this question? Um, you can say, does anyone know what a zoo is? Does anyone know what a zoo is, right? Would that be a yes or a no answer? Is it close-ended or open-ended? Thank you, Andre, for sharing. Does anyone know what a zoo is? Would be yes or no, right? So how can we further make that into an open-ended question? Thank you, Andre, for sharing. I really appreciate you willing to share. So we can all learn, right, from your share outs. I see a question uh, in the chat box. What is your favorite animal at the zoo? What yes, about, oh, sorry. Um, what about, uh, what type of, what kind of animals can you find at the zoo? What kind of animals can you find at the zoo? Awesome. I see a couple of raised hands, Shante. Our, um, I was going to say something kind of like the last question. What um, are your favorite animals at the zoo? What are your favorite animals? Makes them think about recall what they saw, right? Did I see a raised hand from Andrea? Andrea? Yes. They could also ask, what sound does that animal make? What sound? Awesome, right? Imagine that in a preschool classroom. Talking about animals and animal sounds. Are we going to get children excited about it just with that question? Yes, they're going to get so excited. That question would be like, what sounds do they make? And they start pretending. And we could build on that one question. We can come up with so many activities that's going to promote language, right? Was your favorite 
And what sound did it make? Awesome. Are there lions or tigers at the zoo? Yeah, I'm wondering, what animals did you see? Yeah, awesome. And I see um, Guillermo's hand is up. Is it still up from the last question? Or did you raise it again? I'm not sure. I don't want to um, miss asking, giving you an opportunity. Guillermo, Andrea, is your hand is still raised. I'm hoping that it is from the previous time. So I'm moving along. If not, stop me. So oh. what happened when you went to the zoo, right? Oh, somebody was. Um, just like you were talking about um, children that hasn't been exposed or have access. What if they don't know what a zoo is? Yeah. Right. What if they don't know? And that was the one question that you were asking, right? Does anyone know it, what a zoo is? That's a wonderful question, right? But it's a yes or a no, right? In, how can we change that to an open-ended? Does anyone know what a zoo is? How can we change that? Asking, what do you know about the zoo? Just change it. It's the same thing. Asking them what they already know about the zoo or not. Just changing it, putting a what instead of, does anyone know what a zoo is, right, Andre? And so asking them, what do you know about the zoo? And write that question on the board so they can see print, right? What do you know about the zoo? And ask them to share out. And then you will know who knows about the zoo, who has been to the zoo, and who has not. They don't know what a zoo is like, right? And so then we can think about how to introduce what a zoo is. Bring in a book, maybe props, right? Maybe images maybe even videos now with digital technology, we can bring in so many um, resources into the classroom to show them what a zoo looks like and maybe even take a field trip if budget allows and uh, school districts allow us to go to the zoo, right? What did you enjoy most about going to the zoo? So there's so many ways, you all shared wonderful ways um, to, to change that into, um, into an open-ended question. So I'm gonna, we already shared here since we have so many participants here. So I'm going to go ahead and move along. Uh, I was gonna put you in breakout rooms, but the share out was so awesome that here in the main uh, room that we don't need to go. Um, oh, thank you, Yadira. Um, in the chat box, I see a, what a good observation and question, yes. Fancy, you're phenomenal. I just, <laughs> I've always, and it's not because she's a wonderful professor. I mean, she is, but it's not because you're my friend, but because I absolutely enjoyed this workshop and just, I would have loved to sit in class with you and you <laughs> be my instructor. Thank you. That really boosts my, you know, motivates me to do to better, to do better, right? I try, I try, but thank you for that feedback. Awesome. So I was going to put us all in breakout rooms um, and, um, you know, practice changing some of these to open-ended questions. But since we're doing so well in the main room, do you want to just go ahead and share out here? Um, so here is our scenario. You know what, let's go ahead and do it because we got some that I haven't had an opportunity to share. So what I am going to do is uh, we are about 40 participants. So I'm gonna do eight breakout rooms and uh, that would give us about five people in a room. And so here's a scenario for us. You pick up your child from school. What kind of open-ended questions can you ask your child about his or her day at the school? So here is an opportunity. Think about open-ended questions. So um, I'm gonna put us all into breakout rooms. There are gonna be eight breakout rooms, hopefully five people in a room. So here we go, have fun. Uh, here's our scenario. I'll put the scenario in our chat box so you know what we're discussing. So let's go ahead and Nancy, are the questions in the um, in the chat or they're going to be broadcast to all? I just put it in the chat. Were you able to see it? Ah, OK, let me go back. I, let me go back to my room. OK.
Shanti, sorry, I got disconnected. Yeah, it's not on the on the chat box for. Oh, it's for... not. No. Uh, let me send it again. Hmm. Okay, I just got one. Okay, I'll copy it and then I'll share it with my group. Can you um? Can you? Yes, I'm trying to broadcast this, but it won't copy paste. So let me type it. Uh, oh man. Yeah, I'll do that. So what kind of open questions can you ask your child about his or her? No, it's just how. What, what kind of open? I I got it. I'll remember it. Um, would you put me back in group five? Sure. Uh, let me quickly sure. type this, um, or so I can um, broadcast it. There we go. And I'm sorry. What group, Yadira? So, uh, group five. Okay. Um, I see. Hmm. I don't see you to place you. Hmm. Oh wait, Renee's calling me to room seven. She probably wants me to um, answer questions. Let me answer questions there, and then I'll come back, and then you can add me to group five. Okay. Sophia, Evelyn, do you want to just stay in the main room and discuss? James? Um, Evelyn, Latonga, Sophia, James, welcome. Are you just joining our workshop this morning? No, I was just in the breakout room, but I got disconnected. I had to reconnect. Sorry. Oh, okay. Did you want to go to a particular breakout room, James? that you were already in? I think I was in room three. Room three? Okay, let's look. Um, let's see, Jane. Me too, I am in group one, sorry. Oh, okay, Sophia, you want to be in group one. Hmm. I'm gonna put you in group uh, five. Okay, anybody else? Me, group five, thank you. Sure, uh, Yadira, group Five. There we go. Perfect. James, you're back here. Anjali, you're back. Um, were you in a particular room? Yeah, but I think some of them left or some of them not speaking. So it's like... Did you want to go, where, which room were you in? Should I put you back yeah. in one of the rooms? Yes. It looks I like you were in room one. Yep. Uh, let me see, it's not giving me an option to put you in room one for some reason. Can you put? Can I put you in room four? Yeah, you can. Okay, here we go. Thank you. All right, uh, Latanga and Ol Olubukula.
Welcome back. Welcome back, everyone. I hope um, there were some, I was in one breakout room. I hope there were some interesting conversations about open-ended questions. Um, who would be willing to share? Who would be willing to share what some what were some questions you came up with in your breakout rooms about um, questions that you could ask children when we pick them up from school? Um, I can start if you'd like. Sure, um, Stacey. We were saying that it really depends on the age because if you ask high school, obviously you are, you can ask a lot more open questions, but if you're asking preschool and you ask an open-ended question, like how was your day? Or let's say, what was your favorite part of the day? Sometimes they won't, they'll just say, I just played yeah. or nothing, or it's, it's a little too vague for them. So easy for preschool, it's easier to ask very specific questions. Like somebody was suggesting, who did you sit next to in lunch? or who did you play with on the yard? And then, then starting from there, you can ask more open-ended questions. Yes, you know? build on that, right? On their comments, build on their response to ask further follow-up questions. Mm -hmm. You brought up a great point, Stacy. right? My son was one of those children where you pick them up from school. That's exactly what he would say is like, I just, I played. What did you do at school today? And that, that would be his standard answer every day, right? And so I played. That was our conversation driving back home from school is what did you do at school today? I played. I'm like, wow, that must have been fun. What did you play? Or who did you play with? Who, you know, and I start building on that. And then he kind of is forced to answer me in some ways. But also it's about something that he was excited about. Play was the first thing that came to his mind when I asked him, what did you do at school? So obviously he had fun doing that. And that's the mm -hmm. first thing that came to his mind, right? And so I'm asking more conversations about something that came to his mind primarily. And so he's going to be willing to talk more about it. And so asking such an open-ended, broad question gives us an opportunity to go whichever direction they want us to go, right? And so mm -hmm. thank you, Stacey, that, for sharing that. But may I, I just add something to I'm sorry, um, so, um, I missed who was talking. Yes. This is, I just wanted to add something to that. So sure, we have a lot of parents who say to us that all their children say that all they do in school is play. Yes. And they were hoping they were learning too. And so um, I say, well, why don't you come to the classroom? We'll give you another tour with your child. Yes. And then we'll tell you your children's favorite areas. And then when you later, when you pick them up and you say, did you, you can ask them specific things. Did you do this? I know you like this math. Did you did it work on this? Or did you do the art in this area? I know you like poking work. And they said they were able to get more specific things so then they could have deeper conversations yeah. and more specific conversations. Awesome way to invite them, right? Come, come volunteer, not necessarily do work in the classroom, but come observe us, be a part of our day, right? Welcome mm -hmm. them. The child is going to enjoy having the parent and be the, the, the guide for the parent, like more like a tourist guide here. Here is my art area. This is where I go eat. This is where I wash my hands. And so they're going to feel empowered that, they are in charge today, right? Mm -hmm. And this also gives us an opportunity to become advocates of play, right? Mm -hmm. Here's an opportunity to advocate to say how much children learn through play. So here is an opportunity for a workshop, maybe to provide to parents to talk about what do children learn through play or how do children learn through play, right? And so many opportunities from that one question that the parent has, yes. We should all have, even as adults, we forget that play is important in our lives too as adults. I see so many raised hands. I am not so sure who raised their hand first, but I'm going to begin with how it is on my Zoom screen. So Shante, I see your raised hand. If I may um, ask you to share what you were going to share with us. Um, we were saying questions like, um, what, what, what was your favorite part about today? Or what was the, your favorite thing you learned today? Yes. What games did you play today? Yes, very specific, right? And totally using that what, how, why in front of the question, just changing the, the, um, the format of the question, but asking the same thing. So it takes a moment to just rethink the question in our brain and then just ask it to so then make sure it's open-ended. Thank you. Erica, I see your raised hand. Hello. Hi. Yes. 
Um, I have a four-year-old in preschool, and what has worked for me is I ask, oh, did something silly happen today? Or um, I'll ask, oh, who did you sit with in lunch? Or um, I'll also ask, oh, what kind of book did you read? Did you read something fun? And I usually do get a response, and he'll start conversating with me about his day. Yeah. It, we know what they enjoy doing. And so you probably know from based on what the teacher has shared that this is what your child does all the time at school. They love doing this, engaging in this activity. And so you start off there and then have them share what, what else that they did for the day. Isabel, I see your raised hand. Yeah, so my first question when it's the first day on school, I asked, oh, you like your teacher? And he said, yes or no, I love her or I hate her or sometimes because the last year he had bad experience with a teacher. I'm sorry so about that. Always I asked for, you know, for the teacher and how um, you like your classmates and, you know, because some kids, you know, me too. And he said, yeah, I love my, my friends or something that my favorite friend or whatever. Right. So asking the child, right, about their day at school, keeping it a very general question, uh, because one day is not the child had the teacher and the child has to connect, make that relationship, build that bond. Right. And so one day is really not going to give them a taste of the relationship that they are going to build with that educator for that year. Right. So um, we want to make sure that we give them we are open minded about their relationship with their educator for that year, right? So we want to make sure that we keep it open-ended, open-minded, and not add our own thoughts and ideas to their thinking. That's very important. We want children to build their own ideas based on their experiences with their educator for that year. And yes, first day may not be what the child expected it to be. And so we got to give it time and, and see how the relationship is building, right, for that year. So we want to keep our questions very open-minded as, as well as open-ended as we ask them questions. Um, I see um, a fist bump, James, in the... Um, chat box i'm not understanding in what context um so a fist pump to august comment oh okay yeah <laughs> children deserve kindness yes we all do and sometimes as educators right we have our days and moments just like uh, children do too and so we we can have one bad day but but then if it's consistently teachers or educators are having a bad day that's something to think about and talk about and advocate for right and so yeah be the teacher that we all wanted right and so we i think many of us or if not all of us are or teach want to be educators are already educators because we want to make a difference in a child's life right um i am working with adult learners now and i'm not with young children in the classroom but like renee said at the beginning of the workshop what drives me every day as i work with adult learners is i am still touching young children's life through you through participants in my workshop, students in my class, right? I'm still making a difference directly or indirectly. It doesn't matter with not, whether I'm with them directly or not, I'm still touching their lives. And that's my goal, right? That's why I, as, as educators, we got to touch back and reflect back to see why I started doing this in the first place, right? And so Sometimes we forget that along the way, whichever profession it is, not necessarily just in education, in any profession, sometimes over the years, we forget along the way and lose that passion that drove us to choose the choice we made, right? And so we want to reflect back and touch back and think about why I chose to do this in the first place and rekindle that passion in us that we want to make a difference and touch young children's lives. And so we need to call keep that passion kindled and rekindled constantly. It's an effort. It has to be a mindful choice. Every morning I get up and say, why am I doing this today? This is why. And so I want a purpose for the action, purpose for the conversation, purpose for the day, right? Keeping that purpose in mind as we promote, talk about promoting language, the purpose is to promote rich language in young children. So coming back to our 
presentation. Those were awesome share outs. I'm super thrilled that you're all keeping this very interactive. I was kind of thinking, this is a large group. How am I going to keep everyone engaged and interactive? And I'm hoping that I can get those few shy ones to join in more as we progress along. I see a raised hand from Yadira. Shanti, and I was just, I was just wanting to, it's such, it was so important what you mentioned about remembering why we're doing this or remember why we are in the field that we are in. Um, I think that when it, it could be very easy, especially all of us here in education, you know, day to day things that happen around education administration and we forget why it is that we chose this field. So I think remembering and going back of uh, why and the passion, it kind of brings you back to place. So I think like a recentering of why we're here, uh, why are we doing it? Because it's as an, you know, a faculty or instructor, you, life happens and then you lose track of what the passion is. Yeah, so. whatever, whatever it is, whether you're as a, like Yadira said, whether you're a faculty with adults learners or you're an educator in a preschool classroom doing ground level work with young children on a day-to-day -day basis, we have to remember when I get as an educator, that's what I do every day in the morning. What is the purpose of my work today, right? When I enter my classroom, whether it's with preschoolers or with adult learners, it's the same thing. When I start my walk for the day, like when I go exercise, do my walking, what's my purpose to get healthy. And so I try when I walk, I, my daughter kind of makes fun of me because mom, you, you walk like there's no, and like, you know, I start walking at a, at a fast pace, however fast I can get to, right? My physical body allows me to. So I want to make good use of the time I'm dedicating for that walk, right? The purpose of my walk is to get healthy, which means I'm going to push my heart rate to whatever level it can go for that day, whatever my physical body allows me to do. And so that's what drives me is to know what my purpose is for that action, for those questions or the conversation I'm going to have with people and children. And so we should never forget our purpose. Um, so I want to kind of close out asking questions with this. A question that makes you think is worth asking a question that makes you think is worth asking a child so constantly keep that in mind asking questions so here is a short video i'm looking at time we got about 30 minutes um so i'm going to show a few minutes of this video to give us an idea um uh, you know show this teacher asking questions when children are engaged in um activity of water play in the classroom so Can you hear sound? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you. How do you get the water in there? I try to put this in the It won't come out. How do you think you could get that out? If you wait for a little while, it'll just pour itself out. If you wait for a little while, you see it. What you gonna do? And then it comes out. Oh. And then the shot squeeze that. Yeah. Okay. They spray that thing in here. I won't try this. stop here that got, gave us a snapshot of how an educator can promote thought process right it's not a, just about promoting cognition it is about promoting language allowing them to label their thoughts right whatever they're thinking they have to put words for what they are thinking and converse with us or answer that question back right or wonder about what am i doing how can i make that water come out right making them think about it and putting words and thoughts in sync to be able to express themselves. So it's not just about um, provoking the thought process, it is about promoting language. It is so many aspects are being 
um, enhanced or embellished in, in asking open-ended questions, provoking their thought process. So we're gonna move along. Responding to your child by asking or saying new words, right? Introducing new vocabulary to them. When do we do this? All the time. Where do we do this? Everywhere, whenever they are with us, right? We do not miss any opportunity. And this was a strategy that was shared by so many of you when we began the workshop. And when I asked you, how do you think we can promote language in young children? Many of you shared reading to them, right? So here is the read aloud that I want to do with all of us. So here is the book. I'm sure many of you are familiar with this book. If you give a mouse a cookie, right? If you give a mouse a cookie by Laura Joff Numeroff and illustrated by Felicia Bond. If you give a mouse a cookie, he's going to ask for a glass of milk. And when you give him the milk, he'll probably ask you for a straw. When he's finished, he's going to ask, what do you think he's going to ask for when he finishes the milk? Any guesses? When he finishes the milk, what do you think the mouse will ask for? What do Napkin. You a napkin, right? When he's finished, he'll probably ask for a napkin. Then he will want to look in the mirror to make sure he doesn't have a milk mustache. When he looks in the mirror, he might notice his hair needs a trim. So he'll probably ask for a pair of nail scissors. When he's finished giving himself a trim, he'll want a broom. He'll want a broom to sweep up and he will start sweeping. He might get carried away and sweep every room in the house. I need one of those that can sweep every room in my house. He may even end up washing the floors as well. Even better, I need this mouse more than ever in my house. When he's done, he'll probably want to take a nap. You will have to fix up a little box for him with a blanket and a pillow. He will crawl in, make himself comfortable, and fluff the pillow a few times. So you will read to him from one of your books, and he will ask to see the pictures. When he looks at the pictures, he'll get so excited, he will want to draw one of his own. He'll ask for paper and crayons. I, to this day, love coloring. He will draw a picture. When the picture is, is finished, he'll want to sign his name with a pen. Then he will want to hang his picture on your refrigerator, which means he will need what? A scotch tape. He'll hang up his drawing and stand back to look at it. Looking at the refrigerator will remind him that he's thirsty. So what do you think he's gonna ask for? When he's reminded- A glass of milk. A glass of milk, thank you James. He'll ask for a glass of milk. And chances are, if he asks for a glass of milk, what is he gonna wanna go with it? A cookie. cookie. A cookie. That's right. He's going to want a cookie to go with it. The end. Children love listening to read alouds, right? So some strategies as we read, it introduces new ideas and vocabulary that they have not been introduced to before. Ask them questions. What's going to happen next? Right? I model a couple of strategies and intonation in our voices, like for expressions, different expressions encouraging them to, to ask questions. What might happen? I wonder what will happen next, or I wonder why, right? Questioning them as we progress along and trying to connect the story to something in your child's life. For example, remember that time when we bought a cookie at the store, how yummy it was, we loved it so much, or that dog looks just like grandpa's dog. You know, if you're reading something and a, and a dog is in one of the pages of the book, 
connecting it to their real life, that is going to retain that vocabulary or that memory, that conversation in them more than ever, because now they can relate to it, right? It happened in their life too. So looking at the picture, ask, what do you see? Sometimes you don't have to read the book. You just have to give them the book and ask them tell, to tell the story, right? The, from the pictures, they can imagine. Their imagination will run wild and they can be encouraged to tell a story just by looking at the pictures, even though they cannot read the words. So what do you suppose will happen now? Ask them to predict, right? Predict what could happen and then see, did that happen? Why did it not happen? And something else happened. Oh, there's a, then they think about, oh, there's another possibility of this happening, right? Ask them to repeat words, just like in my side, slide, right? When do we do it? All the time, right? In a in a in-person workshop, that's what I would have done. I would have had all of the participants repeat that. When do we do it? All the time. Where? Whenever they're with us, everywhere we are with them, right? So have them repeat that every time something similar comes. Chances are he's going to ask for. Chances are he's going to ask for, right? And they are very curious at this stage. And they love to investigate and ask you how and why questions. How many of you have seen children ask why? But why? But why? Right? Those whys keep coming. We want to encourage those whys to come. Every opportunity to introduce new words through the five senses. Somebody shared when we talked about apples, right? that there, there was this teacher that did an activity using all five senses, right? Ask them, so when they can taste it, they're going to remember about apples more. They can smell it, right? It's going to be retained in their memory bank more about what apples taste like and how, uh, what the different tastes are, sweet and sour and not so sweet, right? Encourage them to describe what they're observing, right? When they're discovering in the, they, they give them magnifying glasses. Those are the best ways to promote language too. Ask them, what do you see? And then ask them to think of, talk about what they see through that magnifying glass, right? Is it slimy? Like throw in new words. Is it is it bold? Is it glowing? Is it colorful? Is it bright? Is it soft, hard? So many vocabulary words can be introduced by that one magnifying glass when they are discovering and being curious. They love to pretend. How many of us have childhood memories of pretend playing when we were young children ourselves, right? Children who know how to make believe develop good vocabulary because they have to express what they are imagining, right? So play, play, play. I cannot em emphasize this enough. And as, um, a, you know, aspiring educators that want to be working with children, you probably already are some of you, you know the value of play. So let's engage in play in, with children, both in our professional and personal lives, right? Let's pretend we're going on a train ride. And what do we need, right? Let their imagination run wild. What do we need if we're going on a train ride? Do we need a suitcase? What do we need to pack, right? You want to collect the tickets? You want to be the, the train conductor collecting the tickets, checking the tickets for all the passengers? Or should I be the ticket collector and you want to be the passenger, right? Just come up with a scenario and start thinking about what are some ways that we can promote language. We were going to go into breakout rooms for the interest of time. Um, I'm going to just keep it in the main room and talk about, I even had Google slides for you to type in your answers, your questions that you come up with. So we were going to practice scenarios, right? Think about a beach visit. It's been so hot in Southern California this, this past week, and it's still really hot. And, and beach sounded really good in my mind when I was preparing for this workshop. And I said, okay, let's, let's take a beach visit as a scenario and think about some open-ended questions you could ask. And can we keep this here in the main room instead of breakout room? And if you would be willing to share either in the chat box or unmute yourself, what are some questions that we could ask um, just like the train ride, right? What do we need? What do we need to pack? What are some questions that we can come up with for a beach visit? I see something in the chat box. What should we wear? Awesome question. What should we wear, Stacy? Yes, thank you for sharing. What else can we ask if we were gonna plan a beach visit? I would be like, what should we pack to eat? No, um, I, I usually ask, oh, have you ever collected seashells? How many can you collect? Yeah, how many can seashells can we collect at the beach? Let's think, keep that in mind. And so when we collect, we can count, right? 
Uh, what tan toy should we bring? Awesome. What's next? That would be my first question. What's next should we bring? I love sitting there and having a picnic. What should we bring? Will we be going into the water? If so, what should we bring to play in the water, right? Or a big ball. A big ball, right? What? How is the water going to feel? Is it going to be cold water, hot water? How is it going to be, right? Are there going to be other people at the beach? Beach blankets, umbrella, right? Make a list. And maybe have them give them a paper and pencil. They may just, you know, make shapes and not really write letters, but that's okay. Have them write, practice those fine motor skills along with language promotion, right? Let's let's do multiple skills at the same time. Every opportunity we can get, right? What should we bring in case it's sunny? How do we protect our skin? Awesome question. Throwing in some health factors in here, right? We need to keep ourselves safe and healthy at the same time, right? Should we take enough water? It's so hot today. Yeah, what should we bring in case it's sunny? We need water, umbrellas, sunblock, right? What do we like to do at the beach? Yes, what do you like to do? And let's take things that, that keep us happy at the beach. Awesome share outs. Thank you. Thank you all for being so engaged and participating. I really appreciate that. So here is another way, right, to promote activity. You could take a brown bag, Put in some familiar things, right, that they are used to. Put them in there and then have them feel it. Don't show. So each bag has a different item. And then you have them feel one bag, you know, without looking into it. And then describe what do they feel? What does it feel like? What do they think it is, right? And they get so excited. I've done this so many times with young children. They want to, they've already seen, you know, felt those materials and they've already guessed what it is. But sometimes they want to do it again and again and again and again because they just love it, right? The guesswork. And so, and so, and you could put different things, you know, to, for the different senses, right? It could be touch for one day. It could be close your eyes and taste this and tell me what it is, right? From based on what you've eaten before, right? Or it could be smell of familiar objects, right? So it could be different things, different ways you could do the same paper bag activity and ask questions, more language, more conversations, right? And somebody shared this, using songs and chants to teach new words for young children. When do we do this? all the time, everywhere, wherever they are with you, right? Rhymes and chants and songs. That's how, I'm not sure if any of you have watched this video. If you've already done it, it's a cute one to watch again. So it's a very short video. This is... You got friend in me. Let's start over, sorry. Here we go. Can you hear the audio? This is... You got friend in me. Yep, by Claire and Dad. By Claire and Dad. Sorry. 
So um, wasn't that adorable? I see a heart sign. I saw a heart sign somebody put in the um, the emotions that you showed. Yes, it's adorable, right? It is adorable how, I mean, I wish I could sing as beautiful as she can, but um, as Claire can, I can, but that's okay. Children are, they don't judge us, right? I am not a great singer, but they would tell me when I did nursery rhymes and chants in the classroom, they say, Mishanti, you sang so well. I'm like, okay, thank you, right? They don't care how good singers we are. They just want to have a good time with everyone in the classroom, right? So singing in nursery rhymes and chants, I'm sure, you know, Claire, Claire is, is, is a musician, I think, uh, herself. And so she's able, able to sing so well. Not all children have, know all the words to it, but that's all right. The more they practice, even the shy ones, even those English language learners are going to join in the tune. They could hum with you. They could rock with you, dance with you. Whatever it is, keeping them all engaged, right? So songs and rhymes and nursery rhymes are a great way to get them involved. Here's another way of showing, you know, rhyming words. Not all children can um, can do rhyming words. It depends on where they are developmentally in their language acquisition process. We got to always keep in mind, here are some strategies, but we decide what's best for the group of kids that we have with us, right? And so collecting uh, items that children are familiar with in a basket, right? Collecting items that children are familiar with as simple objects that they are used to, a toy car, a, a small box, whatever it is. And then you can snap, tap, clap when you chant, right? And this is how it goes. Picky, ricky, tacky, racky, chicky, chacky, chew. I like finding words that rhyme. How about you? And then pick one item. It could be a pen. And then let's then asking them, what are some words that rhyme with the sound pen? and then start having them. And so we must have already worked on letter sounds with them. And so to be able to do this activity, we need to really see what we have done prior to this and they are capable of doing. We wanna challenge them enough, but at the same time, we don't wanna frustrate them. So see where children are, it could be just gathering a small group of children that are capable of doing this and doing a different activity um, with a different, you know, other set of students in your classroom, depending on their abilities. And so doing rhyming words with them and making a, a chant out of it. If you can come up with the own chant. Instead of ticky, ricky, tacky, racky, chicky, chacky, chew, ask the children, what kind of uh, rhyme should we have? And they could come up with something that rhymes too. Instead of, you know, showing them the ticky, ricky, tacky, racky, chicky, chacky, all of them rhyme and come up with some words that don't have, make sense, but just rhyme, right? And they could come up with a chant themselves and you don't have to give them the chant. And this is just an example. And that could be an activity in itself right? Um, so just coming up with a chant that they will use for different activities in their classroom. And this is their classroom, right? We are here just facilitating their learning. It is their classroom. And so allowing them to come up with a chant for themselves. I personally love this strategy, is retelling personal stories. And I think I shared that with you when we first started. When children talk about real life scenarios, then they discover meaningful connections to what we're talking about in the classroom. So when do we do this? Any opportunity we get all the time, everywhere, whenever they are with you and we can use family albums, awards, family attributes, right? In the home, you can have them bring it to the classroom and share with um, their peers in the classroom. This is, this is one thing I love doing is at home with my own kids is taking an old album when they were young kids and talking about, you know, their grandparents, us, what did we do as a family when they were babies? And um, when I was a baby, I don't have too many pictures from when I was a baby, just one or two. And so just talking to them, my grandparents, one or two pictures I have of my grandparents, so their great grandparents, right? And so talking about that lends itself to having conversations. And not only that, you are actually building an emotional bond with them, right? So we're working on cognition, social, emotional, and physical development, right? All of this comes together. We're catering to the whole ch child's development here when we talk about personal stories. So many things happening as we connect with them through personal stories. This is one of my favorites because I, I think I value family and connection so much. Building relationships is very important for me, whether it's personal or professional. And so 
this is very close to my heart, talking about personal stories. And I do that all the time in my classes, talking about my experiences with families and young children. Like I talked about it, it really totally connects to social emotional needs, right? All of these activities, whether you're asking questions, whether you're telling, you know, read alouds, whether you're um, talk, having a general conversation, you're building a connection, you're building a bond. We talked about first day of school and the child is not, has, does not feel like they have built a relationship with that teacher yet. But bringing opportunities as a parent, we can bring opportunities to say, you know, how about teacher, we can all have an activity about sharing our family uh, photo with the class and, and that can actually initiate a conversation and, and build that relationship with that, with that educator and the child, right? Providing opportunities as parents, we can bring that up too. And so it is really essential that we touch all the whole child, all aspects, um, all areas of development of a child as we work with language development. It is not just about language alone. We got to remember when we're promoting language, we are touching all aspects of the development of a child. Um, I still see more people coming in. Maybe they're just losing Zoom connection and coming back. So meaningful and thoughtful support of language acquisition supports so many core competencies in young children. It, it helps them be resilient. When I talk about family stories and, and how we have overcome certain situations in life, right? We can't do that to infants, but four or five-year-olds understand more than we think, right? Giving them some information about how we overcame certain situations in life and how we came to be where we are today as a family is going to show them how mom and dad problem solve, or how grandparents problem solve, how resilient they were to overcome that, right? Teach them self-regulation, take turns, right? Well-being, health, and what somebody talked about being healthy, going to the beach, right? We're talking about health in those conversations. Social skills, of course, are promoted. And of course, we are really provoking their thought process and think critically about situations and experiences that they are having. So it allows them to plan to set goals. I want to be like mommy. I want to problem solve. I want to overcome my obstacles. So sometimes when I'm not able to write that letter, I can do it. I'm going to try hard. I'm going to practice, right? It allows them to practice those skills, to set goals for themselves, all these connections that we're making, right? Bring logic to situations. When we're asking a child when they're in water play, how can you make that water come out, right? Makes them think, analyze that information and think creatively and critically, how can I problem solve, right? Those questions lend itself for so many aspects of their growth and development. We must remember, I think if anything that you're walking away in this workshop is, I would like you to remember to be asking open-ended questions with variety of objects and experiences. It doesn't have to be something you have to buy with a lot of money. It can be simple things that you have in your home, in your classrooms. Conversations and language promotion can happen with simple everyday activities, and it doesn't have to be, it can be even drawing a map of inside of your house or your classroom and start labeling the objects and talk about them, right? Talk about it, ask them to express. It could be simple things, nothing expensive, nothing fancy. Drum roll, we're coming here to recap what we have covered so far. Five tips, this is what we started with. And so I hope we have touched upon um, all of these and you've gotten some um, strategies for each of these tips that we talked about today, how important, valuable it is to just have conversations with our children, asking them open-ended questions, responding to their questions and comments, and then building on that with new vocabulary and using songs and rhymes and chants and retelling personal stories, right? I hope we touched upon all of these enough for you to walk away with at least one strategy for each of these talking points that we uh, worked on today as a group. I just wanna thank you all for being here early on a Thursday morning on a, uh, during a hot week like this. And so I'm so appreciative of your time and effort to be here to, um, you know, maybe get some new strategies to work with children and um, touch their lives and, and advocate for them, advocate for play and advocate for talking with them and not be on um, phones and digital devices. We do that more so um, in the last two years now than ever before, right? I'm on my laptop more than I've ever been in this last two years, but yes, conversations are really important. 
I want to thank you for being here. I appreciate your time and uh, you your interaction. I love um, I love the fact that you all felt comfortable enough to share out your experiences, your thoughts and ideas, so we can all learn from each other. So thank you. Um, and um, any questions you have, I'm here. I'll stay and answer them. Here's an open floor. Um, I see some notes in the chat box. Let me open. Lots of appreciation for this workshop. A lot of people saying great things. I love this. Glad I joined ELAC. I mean, there's some great things coming out. Shanti, thank you so much for being here today and facilitating us through this experience. This was really like a tangible workshop where we can leave with actionable steps that we can do today. And that's the best kind of workshop because all of us engage with children. Even if you're walking by somebody in Target, you're still engaging with a child. And, and so I love that you, um, you know, you just gave us a lot of really good tools and not just tools, but like you gave us a lot to think about, including creating our own tools, which I think is so wonderful. I see some people in the chat that are asking for the recording. So what will happen when we wrap is it'll take a few minutes for it to, um, to upload to Shanti's Zoom and then later today or tomorrow morning, she'll send it to me. And then we have to upload it on the Teach LARC YouTube channel. So hopefully by like tomorrow afternoon, maybe sooner, we can have it up. Um, Shanti, thank you so much for this experience. You are just a treasure. So fortunate to work with you. And I know that if anybody has any questions, please feel free to unmute. Um, let me find the teacher. You know what I'll do is I can, um, anybody who wants the recording, just shoot me an email. If you can send it tomorrow morning and then I'll make sure to send it to you directly. Um, and then Shanti, I think you have, I think we probably have the list through Zoom. We could probably do it that way too. So um, we'll, we'll figure out a way. Yes. Um, Myra, let me look and see if I can find the link for the YouTube channel very quickly. I don't have it up right now, but it's just Teach LARC, our YouTube channel. So I will try to find it while Shanti is answering any questions, but thank you so much for today. Oh, thank you, Renee, for this opportunity to share a little bit about my experiences working with what I have learned, what children have taught me, right? I We learn from them as educators, what children have taught me about supporting their language development. So thank you for giving me this opportunity to share what little I know. Um, so I feel like I'm a forever student because I'm constantly learning from my students every day. So. Thank you for this opportunity. I really appreciate it. And I'm so glad that so many of you are here able to participate in this workshop. And I'm open for questions. If any of you um, have any questions, feel free to unmute yourself. If you have to go, I understand. Have an awesome day. Uh, stay cool. Have a great rest of your day, uh, everyone. So feel free to log off if you have no questions. Or if you do, stay back and ask, ask away. Any questions? Um, thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. I appreciate all of your feedback. Uh, and I, I mean that very, um, from my heart, from the bottom of my heart, I really appreciate all your appreciation and gratitude. I feel the same. I'm very grateful to have had this opportunity. Um, and Gloria, that would be a Renee question. She's looking for a certificate for this workshop. We don't do certificates for individual workshops. We just don't have the staffing for that. We do certificates for Teach for LA, though. Um, if you need any sort of verification for a faculty or, or for a class or something, please send me an email, and then we will have somebody who can work with you on that. Um, but we don't do certificates for workshops right now. I'm sorry. I wish we had like um, this. We just don't have the staffing to do everything that all the all the little pieces, unfortunately. But um, if you need some sort of verification of a different sort, we can figure it out. All right. Thank you again so much, Shanti. Everybody, I put the YouTube channel in the link. That's not a direct, just so you know, it, that's just to the channel. So that's not a direct to this recording. That will be available later, um, most likely tomorrow. Thank you so much, everybody, for being here today. And Shanti, thank you so much for giving um, your time.